Well, I was learning to drive about <coughs> 35 years ago. I read an instruction in the British Highway Code, which struck me as very sensible. It said, always give way to trains. It's advice that I've followed carefully ever since, and so far it stood me in very good stead. An equally insightful piece of commentary, this time from the aviation industry, comes from this report at the website Flight Global. It says this, power failure in mid-flight is a major risk engineers want to avoid. That breathtaking piece of wisdom was referring specifically to the problem of trying to power a long-haul commercial aircraft with lithium-ion batteries instead of jet fuel. And it's a challenge that's becoming a lot more relevant now that the world has started to pick its way carefully out of the last 15 months of chaos as nations try to rebuild their economies and infrastructure in a greener, more sustainable way. The question of low or zero carbon aviation is arguably higher on the agenda of our national governments now than it ever has been. And those long haul flights to faraway destinations that so many folks are so desperate to jump onto are just not suitable candidates for the lithium ion batteries that are used in electric road vehicles. They're just too heavy for intercontinental flights. So for some time now, the aviation industry has been trying to develop hydrogen as an alternative fuel source to replace the fossil fuel derived kerosene used in aircraft today. And now the aviation giant Airbus has upped the stakes by confirming that they're aiming for commercial hydrogen airliners to be in service by 2035. So is that a realistic ambition? Hello, and welcome to Just Have a Think. According to research carried out in May 2020 by consultancy firm McKinsey & Company on behalf of a European Commission project called Clean Sky, the engines in modern aircraft emit just over three kilograms of carbon dioxide for every kilogram of fuel burnt during a flight. They also emit nitrogen oxides or NOx, water vapour and soot at high altitudes, all of which contribute to atmospheric warming either by impacting the ozone layer or by creating dirty contrails that radiate heat. The latest scientific evaluations suggest that the non-CO2 emissions from kerosene fueled aircraft could have a total effect between two and four times as large as the impact of the CO2 emissions alone. That means aviation accounts for somewhere between 3 and 7% of total global CO2 equivalent emissions from human activity, which is between 2 and 4 billion tonnes of CO2 every year. Switching to synthetic fuels made either from biofuels or from hydrocarbons derived from direct air carbon capture doesn't change the NOx emissions of an aircraft engine, but initial studies of hydrogen combustion powered aircraft show that NOx emissions can be reduced by as much as 80% without large concessions in efficiency. And when a hydrogen fuel cell propulsion system is used, there are no NOx emissions at all. The reverse is true with water vapour though. Hydrogen combustion and hydrogen fuel cells emit about two and a half times more water vapour than synthetic fuels or kerosene. Having said that, the McKinsey report points out that although by dint of sheer volume in the atmosphere, water vapour is the predominant greenhouse gas, individual water molecules themselves are actually 10 times less potent than CO2 molecules. Initial simulations of hydrogen combustion show that the ice crystals in their contrails are heavier, which means they fall back to earth more easily. Those contrails don't contain any soot either, so they're more transparent. The result is a 30 to 50% reduction in impacts from contrail and cirrus formation compared to kerosene aircraft. And in the case of fuel cells, the vapour can actually be contained and managed within the aircraft itself. Then there's takeoff and landing. The McKinsey research showed that compared to kerosene, synthetic hydrocarbon fuels emit a little less particulate matter but don't reduce the other pollutants at all, whereas hydrogen emits lower or even zero NOx, much lower harmful particulate matter, and far fewer non-methane volatile organic compounds, or NMVOCs as they're known. Now I should give a little bit of credit to lithium ion batteries at this stage, rather than writing them off completely for powered flight, they don't cause any local pollution or atmospheric warming at all. And in fact, they may well represent a very good solution for short haul flights of less than about a thousand miles. But 80% of the aviation industry's pre-COVID emissions 
came from long-haul flights. And according to studies carried out by the European Union, if the pre-COVID global aviation industry was a country, it would rank among the top 10 greenhouse gas emitters. So hydrogen has become the development fuel of choice for most of the major industry players. Kilogram for kilogram, it's got three times the energy density of kerosene, which sounds great, but it's also got a higher volume compared to kerosene, which means larger fuel tanks are needed, and that can fundamentally affect the entire design of an aircraft. Engine makers and aircraft builders, including Rolls-Royce, Boeing and Airbus, are all working on the challenge. But until recently, the general consensus was that we wouldn't see hydrogen planes in commercial service until at least 2050. So this latest 2035 target from Airbus brings the whole project forward quite a bit. The projection was made by Glenn Llewellyn, Airbus's Vice President of Zero Emissions Aircraft. We see it as something that the airlines are asking for from us. And on top, we see it as a moral obligation that we need to bring climate neutral flying to society. He believes hydrogen is the best pathway for decarbonisation, but he also made the very important point that success would depend heavily on the widespread adoption of hydrogen fuel in many other industries in modern economies, combined with the continuing decline in the cost of wind and solar power to drive the electrolysis needed to produce green carbon-free hydrogen rather than grey carbon-heavy hydrogen derived from steam reforming methane. Nevertheless, Llewellyn does expect the cost of hydrogen to drop significantly in the coming years as production increases around the world. His team has developed three different aircraft models, each designed to cater for a specific sector of the aviation industry. All three concepts are hybrid hydrogen aircraft powered by hydrogen combustion through modified gas turbine engines. Liquid hydrogen is used as the combustion fuel while hydrogen fuel cells create electrical power that complements the gas turbine, resulting in a highly efficient hybrid electric propulsion system. For flights up to about a thousand miles carrying a hundred or so passengers, a propeller system known as a turboprop has been shown to be the most efficient, least polluting and most climate friendly option. Two hybrid engines drive eight bladed propellers to provide the thrust with the liquid hydrogen storage and distribution system housed behind the pressurized cabin bulkhead. For long haul intercontinental flights of more than 2000 miles, Airbus are developing a couple of options. The first is a fairly traditional looking turbo fan design carrying about 200 passengers. It'll have an elongated fuselage to hold the higher volume of hydrogen fuel with their hybrid hydrogen system powering a jet engine on each wing. The second option is this futuristic design known as a blended wing body where the wings merge with the main body of the aircraft, allowing fuel to be stored across the entire underside of the fuselage. It'll also have a range of about 2000 miles and there'll be a very wide open cabin space with enough seating capacity for about 200 passengers. Airbus plans to invest hundreds of millions of euros in hydrogen up to 2025 to determine which aircraft to bring to the market first. After that, according to Llewellyn, the investment will scale up to multiple billions through to 2035. Honestly though, we can't do this on our own. We need regulators, airports, energy suppliers, technology partners, and it's through working with all of these colleagues that really this is going to become reality. Llewellyn argues that airports shouldn't wait though. He reckons they should start using hydrogen to decarbonise their ground transportation ecosystem immediately. He says that will enable airports to scale up their hydrogen infrastructure in preparation for the hydrogen aircraft that will be arriving by mid-2030s. And he suggests that if they're smart about how they install that infrastructure, then they could become very profitable hydrogen hubs servicing adjoining cities. No doubt some of you will be shouting the word safety at the screen right now, and quite right too. Although hydrogen is non-toxic and no more or less dangerous than jet fuel or methane gas, safety will still unsurprisingly be the overwhelmingly most important consideration in the development of hydrogen powered aircraft. No commercial aircraft has any chance of getting off the ground until it's been through the rigorous testing required by aviation industry regulations. If all those hurdles can be overcome though, 
then hydrogen powered aircraft could make up a very significant proportion of the global fleet in the coming decades. And if older existing jet engines are converted to synthetic fuels instead of kerosene for the remainder of their serviceable lifetime, then according to the McKinsey study, even with the expected uplift in passenger flights over the coming decades, aviation's climate impact would drop to the equivalent of about 2.7 gigatons per year of CO2 equivalent versus 5.7 gigatons in their baseline scenario without hydrogen and just with efficiency improvements to existing fossil fuel powered engines. And if the entire aviation industry steps up to match the ambition and urgency shown by Glenn Llewellyn and his team at Airbus, instead of kicking the can further down the road like Boeing seem to be doing, then those CO2 emissions could be almost completely eliminated by mid-century. Now I know there's a lot of folks out there who have a forensic level of detailed knowledge about the aviation industry, and I'm sure you're chomping at the bit to point out any variables or challenges that I may have missed here. If that's you, or if you work in the aviation industry and you have views to share, then jump down to the comments section below and leave your thoughts there. That's it for this week though. Thanks as always to the amazing folks who support this channel via Patreon and help me keep the video content independent and ad free. And I must just give a quick shout out to the folks who've joined since last time with pledges of $10 or more a month. They are Michael McKinsey Sr., Brian Scanlon, Thomas Kish, Auger Flaneur, Matt Cartledge, Brian Dollery, Thomas Faust, Jay Herman, Daniel Katz, Clive Price, Eric West, Pedro Gonclavez, Vince Gabor, and Glenn Cox. And of course, a big thank you to everyone else who's joined since last time too. You can get involved in that and get the opportunity to exchange ideas and information, plus watch exclusive monthly news updates from me and have your say on future programs in monthly content polls by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash just have a think and you can hugely support the channel absolutely for free by subscribing and hitting that like button and notification bell dead easy to do all that you just need to click down there or on that icon there as always thanks very much for watching have a great week and remember to just have a think see you next week